Hello, I'm Llewellyn King, the host of NECFS Alert. Today, I'm delighted to be able to bring to you Dr. Walter Koroschetz from the National Institutes of Health. He was on the program a few years back and was one of the most highly watched of our programs. Dr. Koroschetz, who I shall call by his first name, Walter, because that's sort of a convention of broadcasting, uh, is the director of the National Institute's Neurological Disorders and Stroke uh, Institute. Uh, you've been in that position now for since 2015, but you've been altogether at NIH for much longer. Yes, I came in 2007 from the Mass General Hospital in Boston. Okay, and uh, suddenly there's great excitement and some apprehension. And that is that the government is going to put a lot of money through NIH into long haul COVID, which has many of the symptoms and may be related to myalgic encephalomyelitis, uh, CFS, ME, for our purposes. How do you feel about that? Well, I, I, I uh, feel a lot of gratitude to the Congress for uh, investing these kind of funds because, uh, you know, there have been, you know, scores of millions of people infected with this virus. And unfortunately, a considerable percentage of them uh, are just not feeling better. And now we're know, many months after the beginning of the uh, pandemic. So I think this is a real public health problem that is a mystery. And as you said, the mystery is, I think, very much intertwined with the mystery of ME, CFS. Do you think they are slipping into ME, that this is, in fact, a whole new epidemic of ME? Yeah, I think that that, well, we don't know for sure in terms of the duration, but the clusters of symptoms are almost identical to what you might see in MECFS. And um, the difference in the beginning was that the duration, we usually think of the duration has to be more than six months. And in, you know, six months ago, nobody was ill for six months, but now, unfortunately, Yes, there are still people who are still ill six months after the infection. So technically, um, uh, many of them have uh, severe fatigue. That's the most common thing. Um, the, the frequency by which people have um, you know, post-exercise malaise is not entirely clear, although there certainly are reports that it's common. And, um, and then a lot of the other symptoms, uh, particularly different pain syndromes, uh, sleep disorders, postural orthostatic tachycardia, uh, uh, GI trouble. Uh, uh, these are all the kind of things that we uh, unfortunately see in people with MECFS. So I think that um, the you know, the, one of the issues with MECFS has been that many people, not all, but many people, uh, the condition started with what sounded like uh, some type of infectious illness. And, um, but the attention only came six months, a year, sometimes two or three years afterwards when people came to attention. And it was impossible to try to figure out what happened back when things started. Uh, the difference now is we have millions of people infected. We know when they got infected. We know exactly what the virus is. And so we have this opportunity. It's, you know, unfortunately it happened, but it is an opportunity to try and understand how these persistent symptoms come after a viral infection. So I think the, it is, yeah. The ME community has dreamed for years of 
enough money being applied in research as though the only impediment to a cure were money. Now there is the money, will it overwhelm you? There are those who fear that the work that has gone on among researchers already in the field over decades may be swept aside almost as though long haul is like a, um, an unhappy takeover or contested corporate takeover that suddenly there will be new people, new players, new ideas, and for the first time ever, enough money. Uh, will you fight against uh, what already has been established and swept away? How will you accommodate that as new people come in and new money breeds new research? Well, you know, in science, you don't think that way. You know, in science, we think about what is the problem, what's our goal, and I don't think anybody can argue that with ME we have been reaching our goal or that we have enough scientists involved in the pursuit of understanding this problem. So, I mean, I may be overly optimistic, but what I see now is just this resurgence of interest in the condition that people with ME have been suffering for for decades. Um, but, you know, you know, we, we struggle to get three or four applications for grants to come in each round. We have hundreds of applications to study post-acute COVID syndrome. And that why do you think that is? Because in the community, uh, and I'm, I can't speak for the community, but I interview people in it regularly, uh, there is a feeling that there are lots of ideas, applications, and that they're given, often given short shrift and that good ideas are not pursued for budgetary reasons. You're saying that there is a shortage of good ideas as well as budget. Oh, yeah. No, I would say, you know, in terms of budget, NIH will fund all the good ideas um, that get, you know, they get that peer review system. I don't think budget is the holdup. I think it's been the lack of, you know, I mean, people can't even find the doctors to take care of them, uh, let alone the scientists to do the research. But now you have post COVID clinics all over the country popping up, and they're going to now doctors are taking care of the symptoms that people with ME have been experienced for decades. I'm also hoping that that will actually open up doors that people with non-COVID related ME can pass through as well. So I see it more on the bright side where the research opens up this question, which has been in front of the ME community forever. And now we have you know, over $1.15 billion to explore it. And we have, I mean, I, I don't know what the number is, but I'm guessing that we probably have 1,500 investigators coming in uh, in part of these teams and it'll be very organized. And if there's a chance that we're gonna to get to the bottom of ME, I think this is our chance. This is- How are you going time. to, how you said they will be very well organized. That's really up to NIH, isn't it? To do the organizing up to yeah. yourself and others. Right, so this is gonna be a very organized effort you know, in ME, we had we established a consortium of of investigators, um, but for this for this public health issue, we're also establishing a consortium. But we're looking the consortium to study, you know, ten thousand people with the condition. We'll have a data center. All the data from these studies will go in. They'll be accessible to others. They'll have a biosample repository where people can do studies on, you know, spinal fluid or blood, or we have an autopsy component to look after people have died. They may have died for something else, but to look in and see, you know, what is the problem in the liver or the lung or the, the brain, something we've never done in MECFS. Um, and uh, and and there'll be a It'll be a it'll be a real group effort that's coordinated through NIH, and 
And I think that the symptoms that the patients are suffering from, um, you know, if we can get clues from this natural experiment where a virus infected so many people at the same time, and we can study them as they recover, try and understand what differentiates someone who recovered quickly versus someone who didn't recover. That kind of comparison uh, is really what you need to kind of get rid of all the confounders and see what pops up as the driver. And this is, you, you, we could never do that before uh, this, this instance. One of the constant questions I get is where can I find a doctor? And most people say they go to 12 doctors before they know one who recognizes that they in fact have ME and that they don't have something else uh, from a bad filling in the tooth to uh, some totally unrelated uh, uh, malady. Uh, yeah. Suddenly we're gonna have a lot of doctors treating a lot of people with all the symptoms of ME. How will you educate those doctors to know what it is that they're looking at and, and facing? Right. Well, I think that uh, that um, that that will be, uh, I think, part of the group think that these physicians coming in are coming in from all different aspects. There'll be cardiologists, there'll be immunologists, there'll be neurologists, there'll be psychiatrists. There'll be physical therapists, and they'll all be part of this major effort. And I, and and the goal of it is, you know, to try to come up with treatments that actually work, that that decrease the disability that these people are suffering from. And uh, I would say the first thing, you know, if anything works in this group, the clear next step would be to try it in. Uh, people who have MECFS that's not related to COVID. Um, how will you, how will uh, these people who have long haul, um, they cannot personally, if you're a long haul patient, access this huge <clears throat> brain trust that you just described, how will the individual practitioner, the general practitioner, know how to begin treating a long haul uh, patient. They clearly right have now, not, they have not known how to treat ME patients. That's correct. So, the, so that's actually the truth that, that this is, people are learning on the fly. People who are running these clinics are oftentimes intensivists. They were set up for people coming out of intensive care unit. But now most of the patients are people who are actually never in the hospital. So and, and there are no guidelines on how to treat people. So this is going to be a learning experience. This is a learning experience. I mean, the same thing happened with the acute infection. Uh, we had to learn how to treat the acute infection. Now we have to learn how to treat the residual symptoms. And But I think that that, that learning, I am very hopeful that that can, can help uh, with the treatment of people with ME-CFS, not only will we have hopefully better data on what works, but we also have more physicians who have been, you know, responsive to these kind of symptoms that people with ME-CFS suffer from and have not received the kind of attention they need. So, so for the traditional ME patient, this is a, a dawn of hope. Well, I hate to say it, because it's a terrible epidemic and many people you know, have died. But I, as I said before, I think that this is just a unique opportunity in time to kind of have a breakthrough. I, I'm very, you know, if I, well, I, I'd say I'm very hopeful we get a breakthrough. If, if we don't get a breakthrough in this effort, then I'm gonna be very pessimistic. Um, I think this is our, this is our chance. There are a number of FDA approved um, uh, medicines, compounds, uh, therapies uh, that are being used to treat ME patients. None of them is a magic bullet, none of them, but all of them have some application and some patients are helped somewhat by some therapies. Uh, 
Are you going to try to extend that? And how are you going to get these into clinical trials to establish a baseline? Well, uh, our hope with the effort that we have now is that we'll begin by characterizing the patients, trying to understand the biological basis for their symptoms, and then quickly come to some type of treatment trials. And, and we have, you know, unfortunately, we have captured tens of thousands of people now who can be enrolled. And so I think we can be very efficient in jumping, right? It's hard to go right now because we really don't understand the condition. But we're hopeful that, that we can get some knowledge quickly that will move into trials. And particularly because we think that for most conditions, your best chance of helping someone is gonna be early on. Once the symptoms have been on in place, as we know for MECFS, five to 10 years, it's going to be very difficult. So we really do want to push the trials to start as soon as possible so we can actually help people. Um, you've been at this a while now, as we said at the beginning. Um, leaving aside long haul, during this period, what has it been like working on MECFS? Has it been very frustrating or has it been um, interesting? As a physician, how have you reacted to your experience overlooking MECFS research? Yeah, well, you know, I think uh, I come to the job having taken care of some pretty bad conditions. So I was a Huntington's disease expert, and um, all the patients died. And you know, we had this ray of hope that when we found the gene that we we're going to have a treatment in five years and now it's 30 years and we don't have any treatment so i'm used to i'm used to battles we don't give up you know um i worked in stroke and in stroke you know when i first started it was total therapeutic nihilism no one wanted to take care of stroke patients and now that's completely different because we were able to develop some very some very effective acute treatments and save lives and prevent total wreck of disability. So, so I've seen both sides, and I think you know the answer is persistence and luck. You you know you have to keep. We will eventually figure things out, and you'd like to do it so much faster than is happening. Um, but I have seen in many different diseases, you know, not all of it, it's a small percentage, but some miracles. You know, spinal muscular atrophy is a disease that kills infants. And now with the new treatments, they're living and they're walking and they're, they used to be on respirators and now they're breathing. So, you know, I, I can tell you that in, in this field, Good things will happen, but I can't predict when or where they're going to happen. So you have to keep being persistent. You have to be clever. You have to, you know, take in the knowledge from all different areas of science. The breakthrough for MECFS is unlikely to come from people studying MECFS. It's more likely to come from somebody studying something else, like fatigue and cancer or multiple sclerosis. So um, we, that's, we to... that's very interesting and very encouraging to hear you say that because that is often the story of any kind of discovery or invention. It's right. not the, it's not the thing you're looking for. It's something uh, collateral. It's not under the light, the light bulb. What do you see? Uh, you have uh, what are called uh, RFAs, is that correct? Request for application. Uh, um, have these gone out? Are there a lot of RFAs out? Uh, yes, there are uh, actually all the, uh, all the applications are in now. Um, and we are reviewing them and we hope to be able to start funding things within a couple of weeks. So things move very quickly because we were given this kind of emergency powers to move fast. Um, 
Well, sometimes things really can, but the way the speed with which the uh, pharmaceutical companies have produced vaccines is extraordinary to my mind uh, for the pandemic for COVID-19. Uh, do you expect that we might see the same kind of concerted surge and quick result possibly with long haul? Well, I think that, that that's what we're hoping, yes. That um, we need to move quickly. We want to be able to study people who uh, have COVID and see how they recover. Hopefully within a couple of months, the, you know, the vaccine will take, and, and there won't be any more people getting infected. So, so we really need to move quickly to study that process of recovery after infection. And, uh, and we, you know, you don't know, you know, what you're going to find. No one's done this before. We don't know. We know the immune system is very disordered after COVID, but we don't know how it gets better over time. Um, and, uh, and that's going to be one of the, we actually don't know if the virus is gone from the body, whether there's, whether the virus is actually still in some cells, maybe not infective anymore, but could be setting up an immune response. Uh, we don't uh, know if people developed autoimmune disorder from the big uh, response to the infection. Autoimmunity is one, you know, potential uh, hypothesis for uh, MECFS. Do you think that the funding will continue until such time as there is a cure? It's a five-year project at the moment, I believe. Right. Well, I think that all depends on what happens, you know. I mean, if, if everybody who has the symptoms now and a year from now, they're all better, then that would be great. And maybe that funding is not necessary anymore because everybody got better. Um, that may be overly hopeful, but we'll have to see. Finally, the matter of talent. Uh, I've not looked at any area of human development or an endeavor where talent doesn't play a big role. Do you think with the new funding, we're going to get the kind of talent into this area of research that may not have uh, been attracted here to fall? Well, I know that's already happened. Yes. That, so I can tell you that there are incredibly talented people that I know you know, in the neurology space uh, who are, are now working on this problem um, that never did so before. And I suspect that's also happening in cardiology and pulmonology um, and, and GI, uh, gastrointestinal science as well. So that, that actually is, has already happened. So that's a very good, very good sign. Well, Walter, I know that the people who suffer from chronic fatigue syndrome, myalgic encephalomyelitis, uh, wish you every success possible and are cheering you on and are glad to know that you are there. I thank you on their behalf, if I may be so presumptuous. For I'm, just a, I, I'm, just, I'm just a figurehead for the team. We have a great team at NIH work on MECFS and now a, a bigger team working on the post-acute via COVID. So yeah, all hats off to a lot of, lot of hard work that a lot of people are doing and also the patients who take part in research. It's not easy if you're feeling crummy to come in and be prodded and exercise and you know, blood drawn. So hats off to the patients too, the subjects in these research programs. Mm -hmm. Uh, Walter, I, I'll ask you uh, an additional question, if I might. We are in a period where we're seeing some relationship between biology and physics, biology and mechanical systems. Um, do you think that has any application, particularly the, the, the use of physics in medicine and physics possibly can have? Physics covering a broad range from, from radiation treatment to... Uh, well, well, so, so I started out in what was called biophysics. Oh. Um, and so, yeah, the, the brain and the nervous system is, is working on physical principles. Um, and, um, and that's been true a long time. 
um, uh, particularly what we call electrophysiology. That's how the nerves, they're basically generating electrical impulses which go between these 85 billion neurons with trillions of connections. And I guess the main point to make to you is that, um, that it's, I would say it's, it's physics, but it's, it's computational physics. So the, the real advances in brain science have come from the fact that we can now look at how the networks of the brain function um, and they function with you know, millions of neurons firing in certain patterns. We're just getting at this now. But I've been pushing people for years and I haven't gotten any good takers yet to kind of apply these technologies to try and understand where in the brain is the fatigue circuit. So we all know that you know, at the end of the day, I just can't do it anymore. I need a rest or if I get an infection, I just can't concentrate. Um, and, and so where in the brain is that decision being made? That I think is, I, I'm very suspicious that there's a brain circuit that's responsible for that and that it's affected by all sorts of things, cytokines, inflammatory soup, uh, previous exercise. Um, and, um, and I think that that someday somebody's going to get and isolate that circuit. And I think that's going to be incredibly valuable. Thank you, Walter, so much for joining us on MECFS Alert. And great good luck to you in your research. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you for doing this, Will. We appreciate it. Thank you very much.